On Tuesday, the 5th of November, the United States will elect a new president. The Electoral College will meet in Congress in the first week of January to formally appoint the new president, we hope. The inauguration will take place on the 20th of January, and the next day the president will, uh, and his or her family, will attend a service of prayer in Washington Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Then they will see an enormous stained glass window with the words of Jesus at the top, go ye into all the world and baptize, and at the bottom, the inscription, in thanksgiving to God for the lives of Rahel of Orn and Edward Davis. Why is there a memorial to Rachel of Orn in Washington, D.C., and yet, until today, no memorial to her in Wales? Born on the 25th of August, 1847, in Talavoyle, in the parish of Llangamwen, Unis Morn, Rachel Cox Painter first preached when she was 13 years old. By the time she was 16, Rachel was made to Margaret Griffiths in Hendy, Llangamwen. One tradition has it that the following year, she went to a school for young ladies in Liverpool and came under the influence of the Reverend Henry Rees, one of the great preachers of the Calvinistic Methodists. In August 1866, just before her 19th birthday, she came first in an Eisteddfod in Amluch, writing a piece of prose on the life and character of Ruth. By this time, her preaching had come to the attention of the ministers and leaders of the Baptists of Unis Morn, Anglesey, and they refused to recognise her as a woman preacher. She travelled further afield and continued to preach. Those who heard her were of the opinion that, in spite of her young age, there was a strength, a thoughtfulness and a simplicity in her preaching and in her speaking. On Christmas Day 1867, Rachel was invited to speak at the annual meeting of a Welsh Baptist church chapel in Manchester, writing subsequently in the Baptist paper Seren Cymru, the star of Wales, one correspondent spoke of his trepidation as he watched the 20-year-old Miss Painter, otherwise known as Rachel Vaughan, going into the pulpit to address the congregation of 200. But he went on to say he was shocked in the best possible way. She delivered her address with power and with great authority, speaking for nearly an hour and a quarter. We thought as we listened that we had never heard such a fine lecture. He went on to comment that in many places, it was the novelty of welcoming a woman preacher that drew so many to hear her. He maintained, however, that that was not the case in Manchester, as everyone in the chapel that Christmas night would testify. All would be there to hear her when next she visited. The title of her address that evening was one she would come back to time and time again. The godliness and the usefulness of the Bible. The following year would see her travelling throughout Wales, lecturing and preaching in chapels of all denominations. In the face of the growing threat of alcohol and drugs, she was a great advocate of the temperance movement. At some point that year, she met John Roberts, the nephew, as she supposed, of a minister from Amluch and the son of a lay preacher with the Calvinistic Methodists. They were married in Maria Carnarvon by the Reverend W.E. Jones of Brinshenkin on the 10th of August 1868, when the marriage announcement appeared in Seren Cymru between Mr. To John Roberts, Johann Steen, and Miss R.E. Painter, Rachel Vaughan, she was described as the talented woman lecturer from the North. The editor went on to express his hope that her marriage would not result in the disappearance of her remarkable talent. He was not to be disappointed. Within a fortnight, she was preaching in Penakai, near Huabon, just south of Wrexham. The subject in the morning was another close to her heart, Gwethi. And in the evening, she spoke of Ahrosin, the rose. Was she referencing the Rose of Sharon in the Song of Songs 2-1? At the time interpreted as an allegory of the marriage of Christ with his church. It's a favourite image of the great Welsh hymn writer Anne Griffith. 
Yes, not least in her hymn, Well and Sebig Hunger Murtoith, the words associated in Welsh with the tune Cum Ronda. Lo, he stands among the myrtles, worthiest object of my love. You can almost hear uh, Bachelor Vaughan singing these words. Yet in part I know his glory towers o'er all earthly things above. Hail the morning when I see him as he is. He is called the Rose of Sharon. Sweet and lovely, bright and fair, he surpasses tens of thousands with their earthly glory rare. Friend of sinners, he's their pilot on the sea. What have I to do henceforward with vain idols of the earth? Nothing can I find among them to compare with his great worth. I am longing to abide in his great love. Rachel of Orn was married to Christ. Indeed, she was still using her maiden name, Miss Painter, Rachel of Orn. She stayed overnight and on Monday evening lectured on the Bible. The sizable congregation was attentive to her inspirational preaching as she spoke of the godliness and usefulness of the Bible, of its radical its integrity, its impartiality, its harmony, the fact that it is unprejudiced. She spoke with great feeling. Or ever had not been well in her marriage from day one. On the 3rd of October 1868, a notice appeared in the Herald of Wales. That's within the month, within three weeks of the marriage. Uh, uh, because the, the notice is dated 21st of September. Morning. I, John Roberts, Johann Schlech, John the Slate, wish to make this announcement through this publication that I will not be responsible for any debt in any place incurred by my wife, <laughs> Rachel Roberts, Rachel Oborn, from this day forwards. John Roberts, Johann Schlech, Penwin died by September 21st, 1868. Witness, John Rees. One week later, a response appeared as Rachel Warren gave her side of the story. <laughs> Announcement, J. Roberts alias John Johan Fair, John the Slate, has never been asked for one penny of my debt. On the 10th of August, the day that should have been my wedding day, it was revealed to me that he had cheated on me, that he was not son to the brother of the late W.R. of Amruch, and that his father was not an auxiliary preacher with the Calvinistic Methodists. J.R. ceased to testify to this before the altar of God and before the registrar, Mr. W. Ellis, and before the Reverend W. E. Jones, Baptist minister. Other points will be kept confidential pending the decision of the court of divorce in the capital city, London. R.E. Penter, R. O. Bourne. P.S. If J.R. thinks he has been badly treated, let him raise the matter before his church. I myself will come there. <laughs> <laughs> Ceremonial causes of 1857, only 10 years before, had established for the first time a civil court of divorce in London and gave women for the first time the opportunity to sue for divorce, albeit on very limited grounds. There's a tantalizingly brief reference in one letter from one of her critics that she had evidence that John Roberts was already married. Who knows? Rachel Oborn was more determined than ever to preach and to lecture. Christmas 1868 and January 1869, Sir Robert addressing big meetings in the valleys of South Wales, speaking on the deceit of atheism and on temperance, and preaching under the name Miss Painter or Rachel Oborn. She endured vitriolic attacks in the religious press. One from the north wrote to the editor of Seren Cymru, the Star of Wales. Sir, we who live here at the foot of Snowdon think that in some of the respectable churches of the south, there's a screw loose, as the English say. And you who are able to do just about everything ought to put the screw back in its place by the light of the star. This anonymous writer was particularly incensed at the way the churches of the South were prepared to invite a preacher and what's worse, a woman preacher, without the authority of her local quarterly meeting. Put things right, put things right, he cried, finishing his letter. Another 
Whiter wrote in similar fashion, signing, signing himself anonymously once again as another one from the North. <laughs> Mr. Editor, I fear that marriage is being devalued by your correspondence in that I forever see in your columns that Mrs. Roberts is called Miss Painter. Marriage is marriage. And according to the Bible, there is no divorce except for the reason of adultery. Thanks to one for the North, one from the North, for calling attention to such licentiousness. Even if the court of divorce were to free Rachel Vaughan from John the Slate, it is risky calling her Miss Painter for fear that young bachelors from the South should take a fancy to her, only for the court to determine that John the Slate is her husband and so leave those young bachelors in the lurch. And as for the churches who accept this kind of thing in such circumstances, I will say to every one of them, the Lord is your judge. Yours truly, another one from the North. And this became more heated as she was accused of flouting the authority of her denomination and of cheating her, uh, her husband. Rachel Oborn, however, <clears throat> continued to preach People continued to flock to the chapels in the south to hear her, and the editor of the Seren Cymru continued to report the sermons and lectures of Miss Painter Rachel Ovorn. And then, on September the 1st, 1869, her mother died. Shortly afterwards, Rachel Ovorn, together with Evan and her sister Catherine, joined many other Welsh people and emigrated to North America. Some have said it was at the invitation of the Welsh Churches of America. Others in the family have reported a rift between children and their father. Whatever the, the reason, through the summer, she made her mark as a preacher and a lecturer among the Welsh chapels, that's Welsh speaking chapels, of Utica, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and New York. In the press, some opposed women preaching, berating the Baptists for allowing it. Others were delighted to see chapels inviting women to preach. One supporter, the Reverend J.E. Jones, described her preaching extensively in the United States, uh, the Eastern United States, and in a preaching tour of Wisconsin, drawing crowds to her evangelical preaching and her profound praying. A woman in one congregation marveled at her usefulness and described her as an angel and many regarded her as a prophetess. A wagon maker in Watertown, Wisconsin, was in the congregation on one occasion when Rachel of Orn was preaching. Born in 1830, Edward Davis had emigrated to America in 1842 with his mother and his seven brothers and sisters, following the death of their father, a blacksmith in Trigaron, mid Wales. One account has it, he then followed Rachel around wherever she was preaching. She was drawn to this man of warm nature with a free open heart. They married on 11th of March, 1872 in Fairbolt, the town in Minnesota where Rachel, her sister and her brother had made their home. Rachel and Edward Davis went to live in Watertown. But once again, marriage did not deter her calling to preach and to travel. Their daughter Anna was born on 10th of March, 1874, and later that same year, on the 13th of November, 1874, came the news that her father had died. Anna was only 18 months old when Rachel was off on her travels once more, this time to the West. As ever, she preached on the Bible, its godliness and usefulness. According to reports in Adrich, the Mirror, the main Welsh language newspaper in America, her remarkable journey, perhaps using one of her husband's wagons, took her through Coal Valley, Flint Creek, Long Creek, Old Man's Creek, to Williamsburg in Iowa, and on to Bevier, New Cambria, Dawn and Missouri. The Bible came to life as she spoke to everyone's heart. <laughs> Writing in a dream, Thomas A. Jones asked, who could not admire the Bible as they heard her clarifying the deep things of God from the Holy Scripture with a seriousness and an eloquence that was at once so richly poetic and yet so simple. 
her delivery was so authoritative, influential and majestic. Thomas Jones began his article describing her as er evangeles Rachel of Orn. There's no equivalent word in English. You can coin a word evangelistes. He had no time for those who rejected women evangelists. If there are some who feel too pious to lend their pulpits to Rachel of Orn and come to listen to her, I don't think there's anywhere on earth good enough for them. They should go direct to heaven. <laughs> As he had begun the article with the use of the feminine noun, Evangeles, he finished it with the same word. But on this occasion, he quoted the Bible in support. It was William Morgan who had coined the word Evangeles to capture the feminine of the Hebrew of Isaiah 40 verse 9, something English does not convey. I cannot find greater commendation than in the words of the prophet Isaiah. O Zion, a revengeles, the evangelistis, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, a revengeles, the evangelistis, that bringeth, uh, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. In place of a revengeles, evangelistis, the English has, thou that bringest good tidings, and does not convey the feminine that's there, in the Hebrew. Indeed, on another occasion, Thomas A. Jones compared Rachel Oborn with Sankey and Moody, the revivalist preachers who were just starting out at the time. Their right to preach as male evangelists was not being called in question in the press. Once again pregnant, Rachel returned to Watertown before the autumn and gave birth to her son, Joseph Davis, on the 29th of November, 1876. According to the 1880 census in Watertown, Rachel was the wife of, wife of Edward Davis, carriage maker, and was described as keeping house. With Anna now six and Joseph three, she must have had her hands full. At the same time, she was developing her work with the Congregational Church in Watertown and another Congregational Church in nearby Ixonia. Early on in America, she had found that the custom in some strict Baptist churches of maintaining a closed communion table, restricted only to baptised believers, stood in the way of her evangelistic preaching. So it was in 1885, Mrs Davis was formally appointed by the church meeting of the Congregational Church in Watertown as Evangelis Evangelistes, with special responsibility as minister in Exonia. She would later fund the rebuilding of the chapel. Not that she turned her back on the Baptists of her upbringing, preaching, lecturing and helping all denominations together was important to her. Preaching Christ to the sinner was the love of her life. That was what made her famous in America and brought her praise in all the churches she visited. Rachel's younger sister, Lucy, by now had emigrated with her husband, my great grandfather's brother's wife to Patagonia and the Welsh community. And it was when we were visiting my wife and I, the Welsh family in Patagonia in 2019, that we heard more of Rachel Avon's story. We'd already researched a little bit of it. We heard more of it, heard of um, Tito. And also we were put in touch with Mia, Rachel's uh, great granddaughter who gave a greeting when we opened the, uh, the room earlier on uh, on video, uh, Mia Grosjean. Um, Rachel determined to visit her older sister Grace in the family home in Anglesey. She travelled with her husband Edward and their nine-year-old son Joseph as they wanted him to learn Welsh. They left their 12-year-old daughter Anna with Edward's sister Avrina, I guess the Welsh name Hevina, in Watertown. So it was that in October 1887, Rahel of Vaughan was back in Wales, staying with her sister Grace in Kevin Derwin, Brinschenkin, on the Minai Straits. Not that she would stay in one place for long. Her calling was as ever to preach. And so she was off on her travels again. By the first week in November, she was travelling around Monmouthshire. And in Evervale, we learn that she was not the only woman to be preaching around the churches. The churches of Ebervale, of all denominations, have had a good look at women preachers. 
And although the different sisters who have been here from time to time have been as good as each other, the general view about Rachel of Vaughan is that she's head and shoulders above the others. As Rachel toured Wales, Edward and Joseph were at home in Panidan with Grace. With Grace. On 15th of January, however, tragedy struck. Joseph had been reading the Bible to his father when his father was taken ill, and that night he died. <coughs> As it happened, a cousin of Edward's who had also emigrated from Trigaron to America was the American consul in Cardiff. Major Evan Roland Jones stepped in to help Rachel, corresponding with the family back in Watertown. Evan Jones had founded the Welsh Societies of Milwaukee and also the Lincoln Anti-Slavery Society. He had risen through the ranks of the army in the Civil War and had been appointed American consul by President Grant, first in Newcastle upon Tyne, <laughs> then in Cardi. Edward was buried with other members of Rachel's family in the graveyard in Canidan, and grieving, Rachel and Joseph sailed from Liverpool back to America on the Etruria in July 1888. And I think in this second picture, outside is the first picture there is of, of Rachel from 1870. The second picture is um, she's drawn. You can see the grief on her face and on Joseph's face, the nine year olds as well. They sailed, uh, they sailed for um, America on the Etruria in July 1888 and rejoined Anna in Watertown. But within the year, Anna, by now 15, died of rheumatic fever. Joseph excelled at school in Watertown, graduating at the top of his class in 1894. In spite of her ill health, Rachel continued to travel and to preach in a masterful way of Christ, the head of the church. She belonged, she longed to return to Wales. She arrived in December 1895 and stayed for more than two years, traveling from Abbasorp to Connors Quay, from Blynifestiniog to the Ronda, often preaching several times a week. One contributor to the Celt, Griffith Lean, argued that the reception that uh, she had was proof that the tide is flowing and there is a place for women in the Church of God and that the prejudice against the female sex is slowly dying. Indeed, another correspondent reported that there were now 12 women preachers in Wales. She stayed with her sister Grace and may well have visited members of Edward's family. By now, his cousin Evan Roland Jones of Trigaron had served as a Liberal MP in Westminster from 1892 to 1895. And it seems that Rachel got to know and supported the new member of Parliament for Carnarvon, David Lloyd George, during this visit. After two years and 599 preaching engagements in Welsh chapels, it was time to return to America and go on tour once again. An enthusiastic meeting was held in the Congregational Chapel in Brinshenkin, with Baptists and Methodists taking part to wish her well as she departed once more for the United States. In May 1898, she sailed on the Teutonic, a liner of the White Star Line from Liverpool to New York, and was listed as Mrs. Rachel Davis, female widow, housekeeper, able to read and write, US citizen. In the USA census of 9th of June 1900, Rachel Vaughan described herself as head of the household. <laughs> By then, Joseph was studying law at the University of Wisconsin Law School. He gained his law degree, LLB, with honours in 1901. At university, he had been an enthusiastic campaigner <laughs> for the Democratic Party. In 1901, he was appointed chairman of the Democratic State Convention and in 1902 became district attorney in Jefferson County. Rachel was immensely proud of Joseph, not least because of the way he continued to value his Welshness. In 1902, he spoke about Wales and her future at the Eisteddfod in Wisconsin. The Milwaukee Journal described him as an ardent admirer of his native country, having spent a considerable time in Wales. He had met another ardent campaigner for the Democratic Party and married Mary Emlen Knight in 1902. 
with the birth of Elena in 1904 and Rachel in 1909, Rachel of Orne became a grandmother. Her eyes, that yearning for Wales, got the better of Rachel of Orne, and by July 1904, she was once again on her way to Wales. The Celt Hindain, the London Celt, notice the K, described her as the only Welsh woman to have been ordained to the full work of the ministry. She was back in Watertown in 1906 when her son made an unsuccessful bid to become governor. Taking after his mother, he was described as an orator second to none in the entire state. She made another short visit to Wales in 1910, returning to Watertown in time to see her son elected as chairman of the Democratic State Central Committee. By now, he was a lawyer in a private firm with many international connections. A lovely headline in June 1911 announces that while abroad, Joseph Davis will pay a short visit to Wales and possibly to the continent of Europe. <laughs> the latter, a little bit of an after, afterthought. In the event, he found himself visiting Lloyd George and witnessing the debates in the House of Lord as, Lords as the Liberal Party introduced the Parliament Act to curtail the powers of the House of Lords. He reported back to the local Watertown newspaper, it has been my good fortune to be here in the midst of the constitutional crisis that means a revolution in the constitutional history of England. It's wonderfully interesting and instructive. The confusion in Parliament is greater than any other legislative body in this country. At times, there's not even a semblance of order. And sad to say, what, 112 years on? Uh, the United Kingdom is not yet a democracy. We have two houses of Parliament, House of Lords has around about 22 appointees who, who are connected with Wales. I think uh, there are in the region of 80 or 90 who have been appointed by the four or five prime ministers we've had recently. And until we have a Houses of Parliament entirely elected, we cannot claim to be a democracy. Interesting point. But that I'm Diversity was a bit of a hobby horse, you can say. In the autumn of 1911, news reached Watertown that Rahel's sister Grace was ill, back home in Kevin Bedouin, Sunny Dan, on this morn. Rahel arrived in Liverpool on 1st of October and went straight to Sunny Dan to nurse her sister. Grace died on 6th of September 1912 and was buried with her family, which was near Rahel's husband Edward, in the graveyard at Sunny Dan. Rachel stayed in Wales for a while, preaching as much as she could, but while staying in London, her health began to fail and she was confined to the house. Her spirit was as high and her desire to preach the old, old story as fierce as ever. Her only worry was that sickness prevented her preaching. Via the Goliad, the Presbyterian newspaper, she sent her regards to the whole of Wales. A lot had happened back in America. Joseph Davis and his wife Emlyn played a major part in Woodrow Wilson's presidential campaign. Following his election victory on 5th of November 1912, Joseph was to head up the Bureau of Corporations, later the Federal Trade Commission. However, after the election, his first thought was to come across to London to visit his mother, taking the opportunity to meet with British officials in the Asquith government. He took his mother back to America, arriving in New York on Sunday the 22nd of February, a fortnight before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. This time, their destination was not Watertown, but Washington DC. Rachel went to live with Joseph and Emlyn and, their, and her two granddaughters, Eleanor and Rachel, in their Washington home. As alert as ever, Rachel Vaughan followed everything that was going on as the new government formed. Meeting President Woodrow Wilson and his circle of friends, a young Franklin D. Roosevelt among them. Indeed, he was one of her favourites. She was sure he would be president one day. Joseph's Welshness remained very much to the fore. As co-president of the 1915 Eisteddfod of the United Welsh Societies of Washington and Baltimore, he arranged a visit from President Woodrow Wilson. Joseph was the main speaker at the Welsh Day in Utica and at another Eisteddfod in Wisconsin, 
where he was welcomed to the Gorsen, taking the bardic name Ap Rachel Ovon, son of Rachel Ovon. Rachel Ovon did not live to see the birth of her third granddaughter, Emlet Knight, Mia's mother, in 1916. She died 27th of November 1915, 69 years old. Her body was taken to Watertown, where she was buried side by side with her daughter Anna and with others of the Davis family. The funeral service was held in the Congregational Church in Watertown, and the floral tribute on the coffin was from President Woodrow Wilson and his daughter Margaret, who was to become goddaughter of Emlyn Knight. The chrysanthemums were in the colours of the Votes for Women movement in the USA, purple and white, and it was in Woodrow Wilson's second term of office in 1919 that the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote in America. Some of Rachel Ovorn's legacy can be seen in Joseph. Joseph's failure to be elected to the Senate in 1918 led him to focus on his legal practice though he kept an involvement in Democratic Party politics. He spoke later of being in Paris at the time of the Versailles Peace Conference, and he was supportive of Woodrow Wilson's proposed League of Nations, sharing his frustration when Congress refused to support the USA's participation in it. The family were shocked when in 1935, he and Emmeline divorced, and even more shocked when shortly afterwards, Joseph married Marjorie Merriweather Post, the wealthiest woman in America, who had inherited General Foods and brought Clarence Birdseye's new invention of fruit frozen foods to the world. On 25th of August 1936, when Rachel Vaughan would have celebrated her 90th birthday, Joseph was invited to the White House where President Franklin D. Roosevelt gave Joseph the opportunity to become American ambassador to Berlin or to Moscow. On 1st of January, he, his wife and daughter from his first marriage, Emily Knight, went to Moscow, where for 18 months Joseph served as the American ambassador. In 1941, he published Mission to Moscow, chronicling his experiences a Hollywood film adaptation available on Vimeo, the trailers on YouTube, served as propaganda to justify America joining forces with Stalin against Hitler. And the trailer begins, and the film does, with film of Joseph Davis himself introducing the film. The film disappointed Joseph, according to Mia. The book is very much more measured. And in the foreword, he pays tribute to Rachel of Orne. Under the faith which my mother had bred in me, I find no difficulty in accepting the idea in connection with communism that all believers in Christ and Christ's teachings are theoretical communists to the degree that they are for the brotherhood of men. On the other hand, I am equally firmly convinced that communism as such cannot work on this earth with human nature as it is and will not work for another eon or two, and until human nature is evolved upward to a point where men will be willing to work each for the joy of the working and each in a selfless society. I wonder whether that commitment to the brotherhood of men and a selfless society is the kind of teaching he absorbed from his mother. He went on to speak of the way his experience in Russia renewed my faith in the Christian religion as indestructible, and in the beneficences of our own form of government and of our own way of life. Was this the defiant confidence of Rachel Vaughan's preaching and of her commitment to the American way of life she came to love? Joseph quoted a French philosopher, when you know a person, you cannot hate them. And he went on to describe the way he came to have a deep respect and affection for the Russian people. In May 1937, he represented President Roosevelt at the coronation of George VI in London, and in 1938 became ambassador to Belgium. That year, the nationalised Stedvod was held in Cardiff, and on Saturday the 6th of August 1838, he addressed the Eisteddfod as President of the Day. 
As the Western Mail reported, His Excellency, speaking in Welsh without notes and with perfect diction, greeted his dear fellow Welsh people, speaking of the influence of his mother on his own life, of the connections with Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president, who gave a personal greeting for Edward to pass on to the people of Wales. And then he came up with this lovely little anecdote about President Franklin D. Roosevelt. These are, uh, this is Edward Davis in his speech to the Eisteddfod. While lunching with the president, just prior to my departure for my new post, President Roosevelt said, you and I were most fortunate, <laughs> Joe, in the greatness of our mothers. I shall never forget your mother. She has always occupied a unique place in my mind. She was one of the very great women that I have known. As a favour to me, I'm going to ask you to tell the people of Wales at the Eisteddfod at Cardiff what a noble, great, spiritual force for good your mother was in this country. And please say that this is said at my specific request. Testimony indeed to the influence of Rachel Bourne and to her legacy. In his peroration, there are perhaps echoes of her teaching. This is our faith, said Edward, because we believe in a living God and that the son of the carpenter of Galilee did not die in vain and that justice under law is an eternal principle that cannot die. As he had been involved in Versailles, so he was involved in the negotiations that led to the post Second World War settlement. Here in the photograph, he is seen sitting at the round table with Truman, Churchill and Stalin at Potsdam. He had been, prior to this, American envoy to London. Joseph Davis had, in 1942, outlined his vision for the post-war world. In his commitment to a rules-based international order, I wonder again whether there are echoes of the values Rachel Ovorn had passed on. To win the peace, the post-war world will have to make certain of at least two things. That the peace of the community of nations cannot again be broken by bandit aggressors who through sheer strength would rob, plunder and enslave their neighbours. And that war as a method for the settlement of disputes between nations or as an instrument of national policy should be out and made impossible. The first of these requires universal disarmament enforced by the combined nations. The second requires that the nations agree to establish rules and principles which shall bind each and be enforced by all. By this time, Joseph and Marjorie Merriweather Post had a summer holiday residence in Florida and lived in a mansion in Washington, which Joseph named after his father's hometown, Trigaron. Now home to an international school, the grounds are still known as the Trigaron Conservancy, are a major area of wildlife and woodland in the heart of Washington, D.C. And at a college reunion back in the summer, a friend I've not met since 1974 told me that during lockdown, he and his wife spent most days walking in the Trigaron Conservancy. Joseph had registered a coat of arms with the College of Arms in England and in Wales, uh, sorry, the College of Arms in England and Wales, and in Scotland too. His one word motto captures what for Rachel Vaughan and for Joseph Davis had been all important, integritas, integrity. In 1948, Joseph Davis was back in Wales, in Bangor, to receive an honorary LLD doctorate from the University of Wales. Sadly, there was another divorce in 1955 and Joseph Davis died in 1958 and his ashes are buried in Washington Cathedral. In 1954, Joseph Davis was, um, uh, sorry, in 1954, Joseph Davis presented a 50 foot stained glass window to the National Cathedral in Washington in thanksgiving to God for the lives of Rachel Vaughan and Edward Davis. Designed and made in the studios of Wilbur H. Burnham, Boston, it is of its time and of its place. 
but it also reflects what Rachel O'Born stood for and passed on to Joseph Davis and to us. The window has eight sections, but is arranged in nine panels. The section at the top and in the centre is two panels deep and depicts the figure of Jesus, above whose head are the words, go ye into all the world and baptise. At his feet are seven figures representing the history of Christianity and the range of different denominations that make up the church, Roman Catholic and Protestant, Anglican and nonconformist. And there, the story of each one of them is told in the panels of the rest of the window. At the bottom in the centre is a contemporary baptismal scene, uh, which is in the tradition of her congregational church in, in Waterton, uh, with baptism as a sacrament of grace. Uh, the remaining panels are all in her tradition as a Baptist, with people clearly converted and uh, seeing baptism as a sacrament of faith. And so we see St. Philip baptising the Ethiopian eunuch, a reminder of the presence of black Africans at the very beginnings of the church in the New Testament, that's top left. The baptism of Constantine, top right. St. Columba baptising the pigs. Um, at least some Celtic reference there, and according to one, you can see uh, daffodils and leeks as well. And uh, there is some kind of relationship, isn't there? Wasn't it grandfather or something? Dewey had taught son who taught Saint Columb. Well, we'll think of some connection. But then, most interesting of all, I think, middle left, you see Saint Francis Xavier baptizing in Japan. Francis Xavier, 1506 to 1552, was the one who established a Christian presence in Japan in the area around Nagasaki. Wonderful book, uh, The Bells of Nagasaki by Nagai, um, his Christian testimony uh, as a radiographer um, working in the hospital in Nagasaki, at, out when the bomb dropped, going back to treat people and surviving just for five or six years. Um, and interestingly, when you see a photograph of the ruins after the Nagasaki bomb, there is one building standing, and it is the cathedral, the heart of that Christian community still in Nagasaki. What seems remarkable to me is that, what is it, 1954, nine years on, in Washington, D.C., that um, Edward Davis should have thought to include a Japanese convert, and Mia told me on Tuesday night that he had quite a number of Japanese friends. Then I think it's um, bottom right, Thomas Mayhew baptising Hyakum. Now Thomas Mayhew, 1593 to 1682, was a congregational minister and missionary associated with Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, who through friendship with Hyakum learned the language of the local indigenous people. And while sharing his Christian faith, showed them respect. Is there a little bit of a, a hint, possibly, of Rachel Vaughan's honouring of the local people? Who knows? Bishop Brent baptising in the Philippines was a missionary bishop contemporary with Rachel Vaughan. Back to look at the whole window, it encapsulates in quite a powerful way so much that Rachel Ovorn held dear. And not having any of her own writings, what I've tried to do through the lecture is to highlight words that are used about her preaching in those newspaper clippings, which taken together give you a feel for her theology and for her outlook. Um, I think the, the, the window encapsulates a lot that's very significant to Rachel Ovorn. An internationalism that spanned the world, a church of many traditions that came together under Christ as its head, and Jesus Christ himself commanding his followers to go into all the world. At the same time, I wonder whether the radical Rachel of Orn, I love the way Ed used the word radical, uh, Rachel of Orn, in the very beginning of the afternoon, might have wished to see women and men of different nationalities representing the history of Christianity and the rich diversity of the church and women, maybe, doing the baptising. After all, she stood ground against a cheating husband. 
She faced down vociferous opponents determined to prevent her preaching as a woman and, moreover, a woman who was divorced. She was passionate about the godliness and usefulness of the Bible, about prayer, and supremely about Jesus Christ and the love of all people. I, for one, would love to have seen in the centre at the bottom a tough and defiant Rachel of Vaughan as the minister, baptising Joseph with Edward holding the hand of Anna, their toddler daughter. There is, as in all good stories, a twist in the tale. When in the mid-1980s, a TV personality purchased Joseph Davis's and Mary Meriwether, uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post's summer re residence in Florida, Mar-a-Logo, he discovered the coat of arms and decided to adopt it as his own, with but one change. The family objected, but the College of Arms of England and Wales could not prevent it being stolen. The court of the Lord Leon of Scotland that maintains the register of the grant of arms in Scotland has more clout and forbade the use of the stolen coat of arms in Scotland. Ogo and any other of Donald Trump's residences other than in Scotland will see Joseph Davis's coat of arms in the uh, um, as part of his branding. In the place which once bore the word integritas, <laughs> and, and fair play, it, it may be that Trump does not have Latin at his fingertips. <laughs> to recognise the English equivalent. Anyway, um, especially given that that's possibly the overarching value Rachel Vaughan had passed on to her son Joseph. In its place, he simply puts his own name, <laughs> Trump. I, I, I was saying earlier, um, when I first gave a talk similar to this, but it was very much in the context of family history uh, back in lockdown, I kind of ended on this note uh, as a joke. Doing this talk, I cannot end on that note as a joke. And I'm thinking there's a seriousness here, isn't there? And so this struck me as something of that message. Uh, in 2024, the good news of Rachel Ovon or Evangelis, the Evangelistes, is needed as much as ever, not only in the Wales of her birth, but also in her adopted United States of America. Thank <laughs> you.